Welcome to Chapter 1 of the Complete Guide to Film Scoring. I'll be reading out of the Berkeley Guide, so you can uh, check out the link in the description if you like what you're hearing. Uh, it's this awesome film scoring book that I read um, about four years ago, and it's basically the Bible for film scoring, so um, it's definitely a book I recommend picking up. But I'm basically going to do um, a little bit of an audiobook slash um, kind of give you guys a visual on uh, what's happening as well. So without further ado, here's chapter one, early films and music, the silent movies, music and drama, drama and music. Either way, these two branches of the performing arts have been linked together for thousands of years in many cultures around the world. The early Greeks and Romans used choruses and orchestras to accompany their dramatic plays. In Europe, during medieval times, there were pagan festivals that used music to accompany stories of gods and heroes, as well as liturgical dramas that portrayed various biblical stories through singing and dramatic action. During the Renaissance, music was used in various scenes in the plays of Shakespeare and others. In the Baroque period of classical music, we find early opera and ballet, forms of musical drama that continue today. And finally, in this century, we have the huge popularity of Broadway plays and film music. In all these examples, the music and drama can be separated into independent entities, but their combination as a whole is greater than the sum of their individual parts. Overtures and arias from Mozart's or Verdi's operas are often performed independently and are musically satisfying. Some of these same operas exist as plays or books, but here the aria as part of the staged opera and the effect is profound in a way that the play or music by itself cannot approach. Music for film is, si is similar. Certainly a film composer can write good music that stands up on its own without the film. John William Sweet from E.T. The Extraterrestrial is frequently performed in concert to great acclaim. But when heard in conjunction with the visual of the film, it is awesome and the whole film takes on another dimension. It is often difficult for modern audiences to appreciate the experience of the film audience of even the 1940s or the 1950s, much less the moviegoers of the turn of the 20th century when the technology of moving pictures was new. But try for a moment to put yourself in the shoes of the film goer in 1895. The common forms of long distance communication were letters and the telegraph. The cutting edge of communication technology was the telephone, and only a tiny percentage of city dwellers had one in their homes, or had ever used one. Horses and trains were still the primary modes of travel, automobiles were about as common as telephones, and the flight of the first airplane was still 10 years away. Electric lights were only 15 years old, and gas lamps were still the prevailing method of artificial light. Einstein had yet to propose his theory of general relativity, Stravinsky was only 13 years old, and Schoenberg's 12-tone system of music was more than two decades in the future. Music lovers were most familiar with Brahms, Wagner, Mozart, Verdi, Beethoven, and other 18th and 19th century composers. Imagine now that you enter a small theater or even a cafe with curtains closed against the light. A very noisy machine in the middle of the room starts up, and across the screen in front of you, you see the images of people, animals, and buildings. To you, the almost turn-of-the-century filmgoer, this is like a miracle. And yet, at the same time, the images seem disembodied, for there is no accompanying sound. The mouths might move, the horse might gallop, the car spews its fumes, but there are no words. There is no clippity-clop and there is no chugging and banging of the engine. All is left to your imagination, for the only sounds you hear are the loud and noisy rotations of the projector's motor. However, imagine you are in the same room and there is a pianist or a small group of musicians playing while the picture moves on the screen. This adds another dimension to your experience, and even if the music is just background music with no dramatic importance, your previous impression of empty disembodied images is transformed into a more complete experience. There are still no words, no hooves, uh, no automobile engine noises, but the addition of music somehow makes the images on the screen more complete and less like two-dimensional shadows. From the very beginning, 
there were probably musical accompaniments to films, though the first documented incidents um, were in 1895 and 1896 when the Lumiere family screened some of its early films in Paris and London with musical accompaniment. These were a great success, and soon orchestras were accompanying films in the theaters. At first, the music that went uh, with these films was taken from anywhere, classical favorites, popular songs, folk songs, or cafe music. There was little or no attempt to give music a dramatic importance. It was there to uh, enliven the audience's ex experience. As the film industry grew and became more sophisticated, music in the theaters grew as well. Depending on the size and location of the theater, there could be anywhere from one piano or organ to a small orchestra. The player or the music director would choose various pieces from the already existing literature and prepare them for performances. In 1908, again in France, Camille Saint-Saëns was commissioned to write what is believed to be the first film score tailored for a specific film, Les Assistants du Duc de Guise. Sorry, I can't pronounce French for my life. This score was successful, but because of the added expense of commissioning a composer, preparing the music, and hiring the ensemble, the concept of score specifically composed for a film did not take hold. However, many people in the industry were becoming aware that there was uh, a need for standardize, standardizing music for films, if not specifically composing for them. Music was not yet an integral part of the drama on the screen. It was still simply an adjunct with little or no dramatic significance. And because of the logistical problem of composing for as many different kinds of ensembles as there were theaters, scores were only rarely composed for specific films. Music fake books. What did take hold, however, was a method of standardizing the musical experience of the audience and a way of codifying what the musicians played. This happened with the publication of several books that provided many different pieces of music with different moods that could cover almost any dramatic situation. These books, of which the most well-known are the Kinobibliothek, or Kinotech, uh, by Gwipis Beck, the Sam Fox Moving Picture Music Volumes by J.S. Zamanek, and Motion Picture Moods by Erno Rappé, organized the musical selection to be played by dramatic category. Sorry guys, some of these names I just can't pronounce, so just bear with me. The music director could simply determine the mood or general feeling of a particular scene, look up the idea in the book, and choose one of several possibilities. If, for example, he needed music for a dram very dramatic scene set in an evil castle, he might have seen these listings under dramatic expression. Night, sinister mood. Night, threatening mood, magic, apparition, impending doom, pursuit, flight, heroic combat, disturbed nature, fire, storm. In addition, there were many other moods and also other main categories like love, lyrical expression, nature, na nation and society, and church and state. The use of these books could be a cumbersome process, especially if there, there was more than one musician playing. The music director in each theater would view the, view the film several times with a stopwatch and time each scene. He then would choose the individual pieces to be played, knowing how many seconds each piece should run. Music was, was dependent on the ability of the conductor or player to anticipate a scene change and to be able to extend or compress a piece. One of the most problematic areas became the transitions between scenes that had different pieces of music. Uh, a change in key, center, uh, tempo, instrumentation, or overall mood could be very awkward without a written out transition. Therefore, many musical directors created such transitions themselves. The fake books were successful since they created a set musical script that any musician could follow. However, their dramatic effectiveness was limited by the ability of each theater's musical director. A concurrent system whose inception actually predates the use of fake books was developed by Max Winkler, a clerk at Carl Fisher Music Store and Publishing Company in New York. Winkler realized that if he could see the films before they were released, he could then make up what he called cue sheets for each film, similar to the modern-day cue sheets or timing notes, but not to be confused with them. 
These cue sheets would lay out the choice of music and give timings for how long to play each piece, as well as present guidelines for interpretation in order to stay synchronized. The publisher would preview the film, create a cue sheet, then organize and sell a book for each film that was provided to the musical director of the theater. This benefited the filmmaker, for it provided a set musical script with rough timings. It also benefited the publishers of the music, for they could make a profit selling or renting the, the music itself to theaters. Here is the cue sheet for an imaginary film that Winkler drew up uh, the night he got the idea. And I'll read what the cue sheet says here. So, music cue sheet for Magic Valley, selected and compiled by M. Winkler. Q. 1. Opening. Play minuet number 2 in G by Beethoven for 90 seconds until title on screen, Follow Me Dear. 2. Play dramatic andante by Veli for 2 minutes and 10 seconds. Note. Play soft during the scene where mother enters. Play cue number 2 until scene hero leaving room. 3. Play love theme by Lorenz for 1 minute and 20 seconds. Note. Play soft and slow under conversations until title on screen. There you go. 4. Play Stampede by Simon for 55 seconds. Note. Play fast and decrease or increase speed of gallop in accordance with action on the screen. This is clearly imprecise with the effectiveness of the mood and the accuracy of the timings dependent on the pianist or conductor's ability to interpret these instructions. However, the response from producers and from musicians was overwhelmingly positive. It gave them a musical script to follow that ostensibly followed the wishes of the filmmakers. In actuality, both the Kinotech and Max Winkler methods were destined for short lives. Winkler's system debuted in 1912 and the Kinotech was published in 1919. By the late 1920s, the revolution of the talkies, the first movies with their characters actually speaking in synchronized sound, were, beginning, were being distributed. It was this technological advancement that began the modern use of music in movies. Thanks so much guys for watching this video. Stay tuned for chapter 2 of the complete guide to film scoring, The Berkeley Guide. Take care.